Cokesbury Church, how you doing? I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Listen, I have some great friends here today. AP, Angel, and Abriel Hardaway are here. We've already had a great time, and I'm so glad for you guys to come and worship with us. As always, lyrics are on the bottom. These are some great tunes today. I hope you'll worship with us, pray with us. Uh, Stephen DeFer is here. He's got a great message this morning. So we're going to start in with a new song for us. This is called We Praise You. Let's go. Come on.
when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory.
Hannah and I'm the Outreach Program Coordinator here at Cokesbury Church. We've just reopened Fig Tree and thanks to your continual support, um, we're able to offer showers, computer access, microwave use, um, frozen meals, and laundry for anyone who needs it. We also are starting up our traveler bags. So we have water, canned meat, fruit, and peanut butter crackers, along with our handout, which gives information about Fig Tree and Mana House. You can pack all this up and put it in a bag and put it in your car and keep it for anyone you see in need and help us spread the word about Fig Tree. Thank you so much for your continual support and thank you for helping us spread the word about Fig Tree.
Hey, welcome into Cokesbury. I'm glad that you guys are here. My name is Stephen. I'm the senior pastor here, and I'm honored that you've taken time out of your schedule to join us for worship. It's been a great experience so far, and I think I've got some good news for you today. We're starting a brand new series called The Chase, and as we go through life with everything that you and I have been facing over the past few months, um, this one thing that I think all of us would agree on that we want is a sense of happiness. And the real question is, how do you find happiness when it feels like the entire world is burning down around you? Well, that's where this series comes in, because believe it or not, we've got a great roadmap that'll lead us not just to happiness, but to, that will give us the ability to live life with a deep sense of joy. And so over the next few weeks, this series, The Chase, is going to be based on the book of Philippians. And so if you're the kind of person that likes to follow along in your Bible, um, over the next few weeks, you can be reading through the book of Philippians. It's a power-packed experience of how you and I find true and lasting joy. One of the greatest moments of my life came in November of 2016. If you know me at all, you know that I'm a huge baseball fan, and with baseball having started this week, um, I'm a Cubs fan. And in 2016, the Cubs did something that I wasn't sure they would ever do in my lifetime. They actually won the World Series. And they made it through the Dodgers in the playoffs, right? And I actually had the chance to be in Chicago. I didn't go to the game, but I was gathered the night before the final game to, to uh, help the Cubs go to the World Series when they were playing the Dodgers. And I was in a sea of 100,000 people outside Wrigley Field. Now imagine those. You even remember when we had crowds that size? But then they made it through the Dodgers and the, the World Series started and they were playing Cleveland, right? And it went all the way to game seven. The Cubs were down three to one. It actually went into extra innings and so the game was going on in the middle of the night. And I'd driven to Chattanooga where my kids were living and we were watching the game together. And then this moment that I'd waited on my entire life actually happened. Check this out. Here's the 0-1. This is going to be a tough play. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. My boys and I are into things like tattoos, and so we'd already decided if the Cubs won the World Series, we were going to go out the next day and get tattoos. And our middle son, Joe, first thing the next morning goes out, and he gets a giant cub put right on his arm. And by the time he sent us pictures of the Cubs, uh, the Cub, the other three of us had already decided, well, we'll just wait and see if they do it again. It's absolutely hilarious. But the thing I really love about that moment is that everybody watching that game experienced the same thing. But there were some people who came out of that game experiencing a lot of joy, like yours truly. I could not believe it. And then there were some people that came out of that game feeling a deep level of depression and sadness because they were Cleveland fans. I'm talking directly to you, Layla Smith. Isn't that kind of how life works sometimes? Think about relationships. Like you can fall in love with someone and be head over heels in love. Like who doesn't love love, right? You can fall in love with someone. They can capture your heart. But then that same person has the power and the capacity to absolutely break your heart. We see it in marriage. We see it in parenting. We see it even in friendships. Here's what I know. Most people want joy. I have a friend, and when we were raising kids, he had sons just like I did. And um, I asked him one day, what do you want your son to become when he grows up? Like, what do you want him to be? And I was expecting him to say what most parents do. Like, you know, I want him to be a teacher. I'd like him to be an engineer or a doctor or whatever it is. But he said, I just want my son to be happy. Like, I don't care what he does. I just want him to find happiness. And I think we all want that, don't we? We'll go to a lot of places looking for happiness. Sometimes people look to religion, right? We look to someone like Buddha or the Dalai Lama, or maybe we'll drift toward pop psychology. 
Maybe for you it's a warm tropical vacation or dinner at a great new restaurant or maybe it's getting a bonus from your place of work. Whatever it is, we're always pursuing this thing called happiness. The great minds of the church were very well aware of this deep-seated human need. In the fourth century, St. Augustine said, every man whatsoever his condition desires to be happy. That was back in the fourth century. Then a few hundred years later in the 20th century, Thomas Aquinas wrote this, that man is unable to wish not to be happy. So think about that. It's woven inside of your DNA and my DNA. We can't wish to not be happy. It's a part of who we are. Fast forward a little bit further. A few hundred years later in the 16th century, Blaise Pascal, French mathematician and theologian said, all men seek to be happy. This is without exception. And then here in the 21st century, theologian Pharrell Williams put it like this. Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth, right? I know we're all sick of that song, but it's, it's profound. Happiness is one of the most universal human desires. Throughout history, both religious and secular people have identified happiness as a basic human need. It is, it is a thirst deep down inside of us. It's a longing that gets deeply embedded in God's creation. And this desire for happiness has been present throughout the ages and across every culture. And for those of us who follow Jesus, the scriptures point us to the fact that happiness is rooted in the character of God. In fact, I would argue it's only when we believe that God is happy that we can believe God wants us to be happy. Maybe part of the problem is that some of us have somehow convinced ourselves that God is really not happy. I love the way Dallas Willard put it. He said, God is the most joyous being in the universe. And that's really, really important. Because when it comes to people, God doesn't just want us to feel happy. God wants us to be the kind of people who are happy. His desire isn't just to give us joy, but God's desire is for us to all become the kind of people who are joyful, people who are grateful, people who are at peace with the world around them. These people tend to be more loving than people who are depressed or grumpy or critical. And listen, I can speak about this from my own personal experience. God really does want us to be more joyful and more loving. And so this weekend, we're starting this series called The Chase. <clears throat> this really is an important topic because we find ourselves in a culture that really is struggling to find joy and happiness. Think about it. We live in a country that was founded on this idea that we could attain it. In the Declaration of Independence, it says that everyone has certain unalienable rights, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think about the way that's written. We're guaranteed life, like we're guaranteed liberty, but happiness, we'll go pursue it all you want and good luck if you find it. See, here's the thing. As a nation, we find ourselves at a moment where we are more unhappy than we've ever been before. We're facing an epidemic of anxiety and a crisis of depression. Given everything that our nation is going through, suicide is through the roof. Neurosis is at an, is at an all-time high, not to mention a breakdown of, of families and marriage. Last year in the United States alone, we spent $500 billion on advertising, which basically is saying, if you will buy what we have, you're gonna be happy, right? So drive this car and you'll be happy. Eat at this restaurant and you'll find happiness. Wear these clothes, visit this place, live in this kind of house, and you'll find happiness. We literally spend billions of dollars a year making a promise that if you buy what we're selling, you'll find happiness. And the question is, will we? Do you really think it's possible? Can you and I spend our way 
into a more satisfying life. See, here's what I suspect a lot of us are starting to discover. The chase for happiness can lead us down a really dark path. And we gotta be careful where it takes us and what we find when we get to the end. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna be diving into a letter that was written 2,000 years ago to a group of Christians who were living in a Roman colony in a city called Philippi. Philippi is up, it was up in northern Greece, and it was one of the first places in Europe that actually received the gospel, the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and where it began to spread throughout these things called house churches. It was written by the Apostle Paul around the year 60 AD. And we're gonna discover in this letter that Paul did not write this from the beach while on sabbatical. Paul wasn't taking some kind of break and reflecting upon the goodness of life. Paul wrote this letter from a prison cell. His entire future was completely up in the air and his life was literally hanging in the balance. He's waiting to stand trial before Caesar, who was then the most powerful man on the planet. And he had no idea what was gonna happen to him. Is he gonna live or is he gonna die? Will he be guilty of treason and blasphemy and sentenced to execution? Or would he be found not guilty and set free? Paul literally has no clue what his future holds. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like you have no idea what the future holds? You ever find yourself in that moment where maybe you'd never say it out loud, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, is this just the way things are gonna be? Can I really not count on what's gonna happen tomorrow or a week from now or a year from now? Am I just gonna be stuck? And that ends up filling you with fear and anxiety. Will there be good news for me or will there be bad news? Will there be any sense of joy or is it just gonna always be filled with sor sorrow? See, scholars think that Paul was sitting in this prison for four to five years waiting on this trial to happen, waiting to actually see what his future was gonna hold. Now, you'd think that Paul would be an absolute wreck, right? But that's not what we find when we read this letter. Instead, instead we find somebody that's utterly filled with joy. And as Paul writes this letter, the theme of joy is pervasive. He begins this letter in verse 12 by saying, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Now check that out. What has happened to me? See, we already know right off the bat what has just immediately happened to Paul. He's in jail. He's chained to Roman guards. He's waiting for his sentence. But we also know that Paul went through a lot more than that. Paul wrote another letter to a group of friends in a city called Corinth. And in that letter, he lists this long laundry list of experiences that he had to endure. Here's what he said. He said, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, and I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and I have been naked. And yet Paul says in verse 18, it's interesting, and because of this, I rejoice. Think about that laundry list. Because of everything I've been through, the fact that I'm sitting in jail right now, yet Paul says, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul doesn't sound like somebody who's living in a dark dungeon locked up in chains. Paul doesn't sound like someone who's been through all of these things that we've just listed out. 
He doesn't sound like somebody that doesn't know what the future holds and what tomorrow's gonna bring. I mean, listen, Paul has every reason in the world to be stressed. Paul has every reason to be filled with anxiety. Paul actually has the right, I think, to be hopeless and totally discouraged. But that's not what we find Paul writing in this letter to his friends at Philippi. What we find is a man who's at the end of his life. And he writes to his friends with a joyful spirit. See, Paul begins his letter in chapter one by saying this. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. See, Paul begins this letter with gratitude. People who are the most joyful tend to be the people who are also the most grateful. See, joy and gratitude, they go hand in hand. It has the power to transform the way you and I think. It gives us the mindset of abundance. It means that we have more than enough when we actually become grateful for it. But without gratitude and without being thankful, you and I can easily start to complain, can't we? We can quickly begin to slip into this negative spiral, right? We begin to think that we don't have enough and eventually we start to feel like we're the victim. See, at this point in Paul's life, he's got nothing. Paul doesn't even have his own freedom. And yet we find Paul in gratitude. He knows that even though he has nothing, he has enough, right? Think about what he said. I'm thankful for my friends. I'm thankful that they're praying for me and that they're actually thinking about me in my time of need. He's confident that what God has already set in motion, that God is strong enough to finish it. Check out what he says in verse seven. He says, whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. It's interesting. Paul begins with gratitude. He doesn't put his joy and his hope in any one situation. Because Paul understands that true happiness is not based on our circumstances. Here's what's fascinating. We have all of this research that shows us what happiness and circumstances actually do to our lives. Back in 2002, there's a guy that wrote a book called Authentic Happiness. And it's kind of this 30,000 foot view of all of the factors that influence the level of happiness that you and I are gonna experience in life. And kind of at the heart of this book, there's this little formula, right? It's H equals S plus C plus V. Now, in case you're not familiar with that formula, let me explain it to you. H in the equation stands for happiness. And in the book, he differentiates momentary happiness from enduring happiness. It's a big difference. Momentary happiness is something that can um, easily be increased by the little things like praise from your boss or eating a piece of chocolate, right? Or going to see a great movie, stuff like that. He says that those things will give us momentary happiness, but that's not the goal in life. The goal is to actually achieve enduring happiness. And that's what the other three variables show us. The S in the equation stands for your set range or your genetic makeup. This is where it gets fun. About 50% of your happiness and my happiness is completely out of our control. Aren't you glad I told you that? Because it depends solely on our DNA and our genetic makeup. That means some people are better wired to be happy and joy-filled, and some people are more wired to be sad. That's why you get some people are kind of like Tiggers, and some people are kind of like Eeyores, right? The C in the equation stands for your circumstances. These are external circumstances, like where you live, or how much money you make, or the type of job that you perform every single day, or your lifestyle. And let's be honest, these things are often hard to change, right? Especially when you're caught in the middle of a global pandemic. But even if you could change it, it wouldn't make that much of a difference. And here's why. 
because psychologists agree that our circumstances only account, check this out, for about eight to 15% of our happiness. Your circumstance right now only influences about eight to 15% of the overall happiness that you feel. The good news is that there's a set of internal circumstances that are easier to change and will have a greater impact on your happiness. These internal circumstances are what the last V is about, which is voluntary variables. There are voluntary variables in life, what we think about, what we allow our minds to get captured by, what we do with our bodies, the things that we actually choose. You and I are making a million choices every single day, and every one of those choices have the power to impact the level of joy that we experience. Psychologists say that this accounts for about 40% of a person's happiness. Therefore, the more positive you choose to feel about your past, or the more positive you choose to feel about the present, the more optimistic you are about what tomorrow might bring, the happier you'll be. So to raise your enduring level of happiness, you gotta change the way you think about your past. You gotta change the way you're thinking about tomorrow, and you gotta choose how you want to experience the present. I know there are a lot of bad things going on in life. I know that over the past three months, Almost all of us have had so much taken away from us. There's always somebody telling us, you can't walk outside of your house. If you do, you gotta wear a mask. If you don't wear a mask, there's this. There's this problem, there's that problem. I know it can be overwhelming, but in the end, God has given you and I the ability to choose how we react to that. You and I don't have to be a victim to every circumstance that we face in life. The more positive we choose to feel, the more joy we're gonna experience. It accounts for 40% of our level of happiness. Paul's circumstances were not great. He was locked up in a jail. He was facing a trial that was gonna to lead to his eventual execution, but Paul's hope wasn't found in his circumstances. His joy was found in something far more transcendent. Paul didn't let the fact that he was chained up in prison affect his happiness. See, as research will show us, it would only account for about 10% of his total level of happiness anyway. But instead, Paul chose joy. Paul actually chose gratitude. Paul made the decision to not let his circumstance be louder than his actual beliefs. And so he starts to think of all the friends right now who are praying for him. He thinks of all of them and he says, God, I thank you because of my friends in Philippi. See, choosing things like joy and gratitude and peace, these are spiritual disciplines, they're habits, they're practices. They are things that nobody can prevent us from doing. These are things that we get to make a decision every single day. Am I gonna approach this day with joy? Am I gonna pump the brakes long enough to figure out is there anything in my life that I'm grateful for? We actually get to pursue peace in every single thing that we do, but it is a discipline. You and I don't drift our way into joy. It won't happen by osmosis. And there are voluntary actions that can impact how we feel and how we influence others, and they can profoundly impact our own spiritual development. Let me ask you this. Do you think our world could use a little bit more joy right now? I mean, think about it. Could the world use a little bit more peace right now? Because it seems like every single day when we read the headlines, all it does is lead us further toward despair. And then on top of the headlines, you and I have got our own everyday struggles. The things that we go through, the things that we face, the things that keep us up at night that maybe no one else even knows about. There is a crushing amount of fear and anxiety in our world right now. And the pursuit of happiness is not about ignoring or minimizing these things that are happening. The pursuit of happiness is not about 
compartmentalizing, putting the good things over here and then all the bad things over there and just trying to deal with them separately. The chase, the pursuit of happiness, it's about a posture of surrender and learning to trust in God who is faithful, who began a good work inside of you and inside of me and promises that he will carry it on to completion. See, as Paul waits to hear about what's going to happen in his future, he knows it can go in one of two directions. But for Paul, whether it's life or death, he's got confidence. Paul has the assurance that no matter what happens, it's ultimately gonna be okay. He writes in verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Those are incredibly powerful words. Whatever happens to Paul, regardless of his circumstances, he's saying, I'm putting my hope in Jesus. Like I've been down every path, I've got all the knowledge, I've got all the experience, I've pursued all the religion, and in the end, I've figured out that the only hope I have is the hope that I see in Jesus. Because once I became convinced that Jesus was the only person to step across the threshold from death back to life again, Paul says, I figured out that's somebody I can build a life on. And then he encourages his friends in Philippi to do the same thing. He says in verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Another way to translate that could be no matter what happens, here's what I need you to know is most important. Live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Think about that for a second. He's writing this to a Roman colony in northern Greece. And these are people who are under the rule and reign of the Roman Empire and Caesar the king. Paul is saying, you've got a power that is greater than the power the king holds. You've got a more powerful king. You've got a ultimate king. You belong to a kingdom that is not of this earth. So live your lives in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus. See, Paul is saying, be aligned in your thoughts, be aligned in your actions, be aligned in your desires in Christ, to love others, to celebrate joy, to focus on spiritual formation. See, what Paul is saying is, is conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, take it to the streets. Don't just let it be something that you proclaim when you're sitting in a small group or when you're attending a worship service. Don't just let it be something you do on the weekends. But take Christ who is in you and take it to the streets and live it out every single day. Guys, listen, we gotta be honest with ourselves. Even for those of us who are engaged right now, who live in the East Tennessee area. Things are a mess. People are sick. Some people are in the hospital. People are mourning the loss of a loved one. Information is confusing at best. There are all these voices that are speaking into our lives. We don't have an option as a church but to take it to the streets because Large church gatherings are still discouraged. There are churches, I know, they've opened up in Knoxville. There are churches that are closing back down because somebody shows up on the weekend and they'll say something like, hey, my spouse is at home and they've got COVID-19 and yet there they are standing in the church. But isn't it true that that's really what the church was supposed to be about from the beginning? It wasn't supposed to be about giant gatherings where you pack people in and feel really good about yourselves. No, it was about proclaiming the good news of Jesus, 
figuring out a way to let other people know that you found the answer. It was always intended to be a movement, to be a living, breathing thing, the church. It's you and it's me. It's anyone who claims the name of Jesus. And so as we go through this time, I don't know how long it's gonna last. I don't know if things are gonna get worse before they get better. But what I do know is that every single day, you and I, the encouragement of Paul, can choose gratitude. Remember, these are voluntary variables in our life that can influence 40% of our state of happiness. And then I would encourage you to live in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. Live as if you're an actual citizen in the kingdom of God. Paul said, Christ in me is to live, to die is gain, to live is Christ. What Paul is saying is, if you seek happiness for happiness sake, it will always evade you. It'll always feel like it's just beyond your fingertips. It will always be a chase that you never see come to conclusion. But if you seek God and if you pursue Jesus, what you'll find is an enduring joy and true happiness along the way because God's faithfulness and God's love, they transcend human reality. Cokesbury, I love you guys. I pray for you guys every single day. I pray that you have strength. I pray that God's grace will be evident in your life. I pray that together, even in moments when we can't see each other face to face, that somebody will look back one day and say it was because of the will of the people of Cokesbury Church that the world started to change. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you.
sir. One more. Yeah. Come on. You are we make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. And my God, that is who you are. Hey, I want to thank you guys for hanging out with us and worshiping. Listen, I want to thank AP, Abriel, and Angel for being with us this morning. Man, this was such a treat. Thank you guys for being here. Listen, uh, it's great to be with you guys. Keep checking us out online on all the other services. Check the website for information for all the events we have going on. Listen, we love you guys. We're thinking about you all the time. Stay safe. Love you. So long. Come on, Wes, let's take it out.